Let's be honest for a moment. As designers, we all have been there. You get a new project and the excitement takes over. What's the first thing you do? Jump right into Figma, jump right into hands-on. I know you do it. But here's one thing, we all have heard the term brainstorming. But how many times do we actually stop and ask the right questions before we start? What really happens during brainstorming? What kind of questions should you ask and what should you be listening to? These questions are what makes brainstorming useful and they are key to designing smarter, not harder. Now here's the truth. If you skip this step and jump into the design without getting the right details, you're probably setting yourself up for problems later on. Missing features, confused users, you feel you have solved the problem, but actually you haven't and a lot more. And believe me, many designers, even the senior ones make this mistake. But don't worry, I've got you covered. In this video, I'll show you 10 essential questions to ask before you begin any UX projects. These should guide your very first conversation brainstorming and will help you get clear on what you're actually designing and why. Also remember that these are not the only questions you ask, but if you're completely clueless and you're not sure where to start, this set of 10 questions is a great place for you to begin. We'll talk about understanding who your users are, what success looks like, what limitations you have and more and all the things that are often missed at the beginning. By the end of this video, you'll have a solid, repeatable process to guide your brainstorming and design with more confidence. Trust me, you'll want to stick around for this one. Let's dive in. Question number one, who are we solving this problem for? The you in UX is user and this question is about knowing your users. Imagine you're designing an app for parents to manage the school schedules and activities for their kids. Here, your users may be tech savvy millennials, but that's not where it ends. They are busy parents who may not have a lot of time to spend on their phone. You need to think about what is important for them. Quick, easy to access schedules, reminders for important events, and minimal interactions. For instance, a simple clean interface with big buttons for easy navigation would probably work better than a complex feature-heavy design. Knowing that parents often juggle between work, school, runs and household chores means designing an experience that helps them quickly find what they need rather than overwhelming them with unnecessary features. You see, it's beyond the tech literacy or age of your users. It's very situational. Understanding what is the most important thing for your users is crucial, but along with that, it is also equally important to know what is the second most important thing and perhaps what is just good to have. Without this clarity, you may end up treating everything as equally important, which leads to mediocre design. The key to a great user experience is knowing your users so well that you can make decisions on their behalf. This allows you to focus on what truly matters and ultimately create a better, more intuitive experience for them. Question number two, what is the desired outcome or success metric? Now, this might sound like a simple question. What is the design outcome? Of course, to create a great user experience and solve the problem for the user, right? Well, it's not that simple. The desired outcome of your design can again be classified into multiple buckets. Your design should balance the needs of everyone who's present in the system. For example, imagine you're designing a checkout page for an e-commerce website. Your desired outcome is of course to enable your users to complete the purchase, which includes a snapshot of items that you're about to buy, any special instructions that you might want to add, the address where the items will be delivered, along with information around the time of delivery, the coupons, discounts, payment methods, payable amount, so on and so forth. Now, this is just one part of the system. The other sides are the sellers, the business of your own company and any other party who might be involved. And your success metric has to affect all of these people. For example, your success metric could be to increase the conversion rate, which is the percentage of visitors who complete their purchases versus someone who merely visits. To do this, you might focus on reducing the friction in the checkout process, like eliminating unnecessary form fields or adding trust signals such as security badges and so on. You might prioritize a fast, seamless experience with features like autofill addresses or one-click checkout options. Similarly, if your success metric is to increase the average order value, you might want to think of doing some kind of cross sell on the card so that people buy more items, which increases the value of an average order. What if increasing conversion rate as well as increasing average order value are both your success matrix? What will you do? This feels like a contradiction, right? We just discussed that to increase conversion rate, we need to reduce friction by eliminating unnecessary forms and fields. But again, to increase the average order value, we may need to cross sell as well, which is including another layer of friction. This is where you balance between the two approaches. And that's exactly why understanding what defines success will guide your design decisions, whether that's improving speed, ease of use or customer retention or a mix of all of these. Question number three, what are the constraints? Just like life is not a bed of roses, your work isn't too. 
which means situations will never be straightforward as you may assume for your mock projects. There will be a lot of constraints and challenges. Imagine you're designing a mobile app with a tight six-week deadline and a limited budget. The client also wants you to work on both iOS and Android, so you need to think about a cross-platform design. On top of that, users may have slow internet connections. So the app needs to work even on poor networks. These technical, budget, and user-related constraints guide your design choices. For example, you may choose a simple, clean design that works across both platforms easily and make sure that the app can work offline or use less data for users who have slower internet connection. By understanding these limitations from the start, you can avoid wasting time on unnecessary features or complicated designs keeping the project on track and within budget while still meeting the user needs. Question number four, what's already been tried or exists. Now imagine you're designing a new social media app, but before diving into brainstorming ideas, you take a look at competitors like Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. You may notice that Instagram's feed layout works for showcasing images, but many users struggle with finding friends or accounts to follow. I'm just calling out, it's a hypothetical scenario. By analyzing these issues, you can decide to create a simpler, more efficient, friend search feature for your app, perhaps one that syncs with phone contacts or integrates with other social media platforms. You may also uncover common pain points like difficult navigation or privacy concerns from user feedback on these platforms. In addition to checking out existing competitive products, it's also recommended to check out the Play Store and the App Store reviews of these apps. You will get to know a lot about what is working and what is not working from them from those user reviews. You see, life is too short to learn only from your own experiences and mistakes. You need to learn from others' mistake and successes too. And that's why analyzing what already exists is so important. If you skip this step and start building something based on your gut feeling without considering what's out there, you risk repeating mistakes that others might have already made or creating a solution that is inferior to something that already exists. If your product doesn't improve on what is already available, it'll struggle to gain traction and in the worst case, it could fail completely. You definitely don't want that. Imagine someone trying to launch an app in 2025 that is a collection of restaurant menu pictures with users dialing the numbers printed on each of this menu to place an order and then waiting two to three hours for delivery. In 2025, this kind of app would most likely be dead on arrival. Why? Because we already have services like Swiggy and Zomato where you can see rich interactive menus, place orders directly within the app, and have food delivered to you in some 30 to 40 minutes and sometimes even under 10 minutes. If this app were created 15 years ago, it might have worked given the lack of other alternatives, but in 2025, with far better options already in place, an app like this simply wouldn't be the expectations of the users. Answering these first four questions already gives you a clear sense of direction. With this foundation laid, the next step is to capture and organize those insights effectively. And for that, I'd recommend setting up a task-based tracker for each UX project with Udo. Here's how. Once you've created a new project and set up all the stages, make a dedicated task for your 10 question checklist. Before any wireframes or user flows, this task becomes the foundation of your project. Title it Product Discovery 10 Questions and inside, list out each question with space to document the answers that you derive after brainstorming with your stakeholders. Once you've answered all these questions, move the task card to the completed section in your Kanban board and color code it separately so that you can always circle back on those answers whenever needed. Remember, you need to keep referring back to this answer every now and then during the course of your design journey. These aren't one and done decisions, they're reference points for the entire project. From there, start creating subtasks based on those answers, whether it's user research, journey mapping, or stakeholders reviews and tackle each systematically. You see, you'll not get the answers to all these questions simply by discussing within yourself or your stakeholders. At times, you may actually need to step out and speak to some real users to get these answers. So that's why this documentation will really help. Use Odoo's Kanban view to track progress, Gantt view to manage timelines and dependencies, and Chatter to document discussions and feedback within each task. This keeps your UX project focused, accountable, and aligned from the start to finish. And the best thing about Udo is that the first app that they offer is free forever with unlimited users and free hosting. Check it out from the link in the description. All right, let's move to question number five. What will happen if this is not built? Now, this might sound like a counterintuitive question, but this question actually helps you assess the importance and urgency of the project that you're working on. It forces you to think about the consequences of not creating a particular feature or the entire product itself, and also raises additional follow-up questions. What will happen if this is not built? Will it result in missed opportunity to solve a real user problem? Will users turn to competitors? Will it solve the problem only partially? 
For example, imagine you're designing a banking app and decide not to build an instant fund transfer feature. Without this capability, users may experience frustration and resort to other banking apps that offer quick and real-time transfers. This could significantly affect user retention and satisfaction. This question helps prioritize the most critical features, clarifies risk, and ensures you're focusing on solving a real problem that matters most to the users. It also aligns stakeholders and helps you stay on track with user expectations and market trends. Ultimately, it ensures you're building what truly adds value. Question number six, what is the broader context or ecosystem this solution fits into? Now imagine you're designing a smart home security app. Your new app won't be the first of its kind. Your user perhaps already uses voice assistants like Alexa, Google Home or Siri, smart doorbells, security cameras and connected light bulbs which they already have. Now they will expect everything to work together without fiddling in five different dashboards or apps. If you ignore that ecosystem, your app will force people to juggle between separate logins, duplicate device names, and mismatch alerts, guaranteed frustration. But when you design with the ecosystem in mind, you adopt the common standards so that your app auto discovers existing devices, maybe plug into voice assistant so that users can set the system with simple keywords like hello and good night, share events with other services. Imagine a triggered motion sensor can automatically switch on smart lights or send a clip to the family. Reuse existing room names and routines instead of making users set up everything twice once again from the scratch. By becoming a natural extension of the smart home stack, your product saves setup time, reduces cognitive load and feels instantly familiar. If you skip this question, you may end up launching just another extra app people uninstall after a week. Designing for the broader context isn't a nice to have, it's the difference between fitting seamlessly into daily life and being left on the shelf. Question number seven, how does this align with the brand values and tone? Imagine you're designing a fitness app for a brand that is known for being energetic, motivating, and fun. If the brand promotes a go-getter attitude, you'll want to design an interface that's bold, vibrant, and full of energy. Maybe using bright colors along with dynamic images of people working out. This design should feel inspiring to users, reflecting the brand's personality and engaging them on an emotional level. Now for this, the question is important because you will need to have access to some of those things. If your client has a particular shade of colors, there's a design system or a brand guideline, you need to have access to that. If there's a need of images, you'll have to call out for a photo shoot or for stock images because you wouldn't want to get stuck while you're designing if this question is not discussed. There are many other internal decisions as well. For example, instead of a static dashboard, you might want to use progress bar, badges, or animated rewards to keep users motivated. The design stone should make users feel empowered and supported, aligning with the brand's identity. Question number eight, what are the key use cases we need to address? Let's say you're designing a ride hailing app for a busy city. Rather than trying to cover everything taxis can possibly do, you first pin down two or three must-have scenarios that the design absolutely needs to cover. One use case could be, I need a ride. One use case would be, I need a ride right now. Primary flow, highest volume. The user opens the app, sees nearby cars, books in two taps and watches the driver arrive. Every screen, button and micro interaction should make this scene as fast and stress-free as possible. Another use case could be, I need a ride later. Scheduling flow. Users who commute at the same time each morning or they want to book a cab for their airport ride want to pre-book a car for 8 a.m. for instance. The design must let them pick a future time, lock in a fare and get clear reminder before the driver arrives. Another use case and not so happy one could be, something went wrong. Edge case flows. The driver cancels or the passenger wants to change the destination mid of the trip. The app needs an obvious way to reassign a driver, update the fare or offer a quick customer support without forcing the user to start from the scratch once again. By focusing on these specific concrete use cases, you avoid scattering effort across dozens of nice to have. You can prototype, test and refine each scenario until it feels effortless and only then branch out on lower priority features like loyalty points on in-app music controls and so on. In short, this question ensures that you and the team decide two to three critical cases that keep everyone aligned on what truly makes or breaks the experience. Question number nine, how will we gather and respond to user feedback? Suppose you're building a personal finance app that helps Gen Z users to track spending and save for weekend getaways. Asking this question, that single question can flip the conversation. It forces everyone to define success in terms of real voices of the users and not merely opinions of people in the room. It sets a rhythm for listening, so feedback isn't a one-off survey, but a habit baked on into every release. It keeps the roadmap honest. 
If a shiny idea can't be tested or measured, it probably shouldn't ship at all. It aligns design product and engineering on what happens next, when users love or hate something. Once you've agreed that user feedback is the North Star, the how practically writes itself. The real power lies in asking the question early. It ensures the app evolves with those Gen Z users instead of drifting away from them. And finally, last but not the least, question number 10. Who are the key stakeholders and how will decisions be made? Now, this is a very internal question specific to your company. But imagine you are redesigning an online grocery site. The project seems easy until you realize that different voices all want different things. Marketing wants brighter banners to push weekend offers. Engineering warns that big design changes will slow the page load time and the legal team insists every change meets new data rules. If you never ask who's actually in charge here and how will we choose, two painful things can happen. Number one, endless tug of war. Each group thinks that their request is top priority. Without a clear owner and a decision maker, meetings turn into polite arguments and the project crawls. Number two, design by surprise. You polish a new layout only to learn the VP who was never consulted hates bright banners and now you're back to square one, blowing the timeline and morale. Simply asking this question early sets the stage. It maps out whose approval really matters, how conflicts get resolved, and when feedback is final. That clarity keeps work moving, project timelines, and saves everyone from last-minute changes. In short, knowing who decides is just as critical as knowing what to decide. And that was the checklist, 10 questions that keep your UX projects sharp and on track. If this helped, hit the like, subscribe, and tell me which question you'll be asking first. And if you want to level up even more, check out this video on building a UX portfolio that will get your job in 2025, and this video to see if you would ever get into UX design. This is Sapta signing off. See you all in the next one.